Jeez. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the Growing Band Director mm -hmm. podcast. Um, this is called Maximizing Your Show Design Process and Your Show Outcome. We have the great Tom Lazat on the on the broadcast with us. Tom, how you doing? I'm doing great, Kyle. Great to see you. Fresh off DCI Top 12. Absolutely. <laughs> Jeff, speak to us. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see Tom and great to see you, Kyle. Even though I do see you, Kyle, every day, except for Saturday and Sunday. Right now. <laughs> Bandcamp. We love Bandcamp. So um, let's start with a recap of DCI this summer from the your perspective, Tom. Um, in case people don't know, uh, Tom is a Mellophone tech and has been a longtime member, a staff member of the Colts. Um, and they were top 12 with their show, The Silk Road. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. It was a, a magical summer. And uh, as the amount of time that I've done that uh, activity, occasionally you will have a summer that it's, that it's uh, everything seems to fall into place and it's uh, the vibe is great. The show works well. Uh, I was particularly proud of the work of the uh, Colts. I'd been with them off and on uh, for 18 years and uh, never having made the finals. And then to be able to not only make the finals, but to be 11th this year was great. But the most important part about it, uh, it was it's the journey. It's the mm -hmm. John Wooden thing of, um, you know, it, it's the journey, not the end. And it was a great group of kids, a uh, great group of uh, faculty, very, very positive, uh, good designers who did a really, really good uh, job of putting the show together. <clears throat> and um, everything, you know, minus the, the COVID aspects of it that we had to deal with for a little bit, uh, everything went very, very smoothly. And I'm just so uh, happy and uh, proud for that organization. They really know how to treat people the right way. It's a great atmosphere for, for kids. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the mellophones. Uh, in all my years of doing uh, education, this was the finest group of uh, individuals I've ever worked with, really intelligent, really hardworking, and uh, the material they had to perform was really difficult, and the final analysis, uh, very proud of their work. So, Jeff, from your perspective, what did you, what, what did Jeff say about the Colts this year? Oh, I thought it was a very creative show. The first time I saw them back in second week of the season, I think it was, um, I had written Tom saying how proud I was of all the work the Colts staff had done and how wonderful it was. And he and I talked about things that were going to be happening during the course of the season. And indeed, they did happen. I, I love the growth in the horn line. Mm -hmm. I, I love the growth in the guard uh, because, you know, beginning of the season, they're just starting to put everything together. But by the end of the season, they were stupendous performers. Uh, Drumline was very good from the start, from the, the start. But I liked how... The show evolved during the course of the season and how it grew and how it showed a greater detail to certain aspects of the show so that it conveyed the thought line of the Silk Road real well. And um, I was just thrilled to see that they they were 11th place. Um, I was a little prejudiced. I had them in 13th, uh, not 13th, 10th <laughs> place, 10th <tenth> place, <laughs> one higher. I was thinking about Mandarin's. I was thinking about the number 13 because that was something that I saw on the show all the time. I thought they were, I thought they should have been a little bit higher than what they were, but you know, I'm not the person writing the number down on the on the sheet of paper. And uh, 10th place would have made me even happier. But 11th is fabulous, and um, I think all I think if you take the cores and pull them out, the path that the Colts went was a similar path that a lot of the other top five went in how they designed and how they put things together. And I just see that the Colts have a stupendous future. I, I bet we'll see them like much higher next year just because of the direction the staff has taken them and how creative they were. It was just, it was a wonderful thing to watch and see it evolve. And I was really happy for Tom because I know how many hours he puts into thinking about it and trying to teach the kids to emote the way they should. You know, Jeff, one thing that you, that you mentioned is particularly important is as it applies to this uh, uh, broadcast, and you mentioned the color guard, uh, the writing of that was really, really excellent. And they turned out to be a huge advantage for the core. And here's the interesting thing. It was by far the smallest guard in uh, DCI. A lot of those guards are 35 and 40 uh, members. And this was just a few over 20. But because of how it was staged uh, and how it was written, it was a distinct advantage and no one at any point in time said, Oh, you have a small guard. Uh, you know, it's a problem for you. Um, and a lot of it was because 
there were a lot of uh, musical vignettes. There were a couple of spots in the show where it was a, a soloist and a soloist on uh, a cart. And the way that it was integrated, uh, they would take a small amount of guard, maybe you know three weapons persons uh, in the same vicinity as the um, soloist, and it would tie together very, very musically. There was a focal point that was very strong. You were not drawn to the fact that it was not a huge guard. And then there were other times they really spread them out to give the illusion that it was a lot larger than it was. So it, to me, that program really demonstrates the importance of the planning process. Um, that uh, design team spent two years on that show. Um, Pre-pandemic, they had a lot of that worked out. And then during the pandemic, they uh, just kept on working through it. Uh, and in the last season, the, the truncated season, they did you know another uh, production, but they kept on working on, on the uh, Silk Road. And uh, over the course of the past um, couple of years, they have taken two weeks off, and otherwise they've met every single week to work out every single detail. And that was really the biggest factor in the drum corps getting into the finals. In the, in the past, they have marched pretty well. They have uh, uh, played pretty well. Um, but there was a distinct uh, approach here in saying that we need to have more show. We need to have more uh, content and more um, things that we can be credited for from a design viewpoint and a technical viewpoint if we're going to be credible. And that was, I'll tell you, it was a little bit tricky in that one of the first things that the um, brass designer, who, by the way, this is his first uh, uh, drum corps show that he's written, but his first thing is we need to be more technical. So we had to start from scratch the whole thing of teaching multiple tonguing. Uh, that group had never, ever done multiple tonguing or any sort. So we were like, it was double tonguing 101, triple tonguing 101. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, in the beginning stages a little bit... Um, scary but uh in, in the final analysis it was it, that's an important uh building block for them in the future and i think you're right because i never counted how many people were in the colts guard but i never was for a loss of guard occurring and filling in or portraying the activity so that points out to our listeners a real important fact you don't need a big guard you just got to use your guard effectively to that's make it work that's correct. I agree. Because, you know, this podcast is designed for people who are public school teachers, private school teachers, and those of us who have marching bands, you know, we don't have the numbers usually of a drum corps, and especially the, you know, the time and the, the financial resources and the talent and all that stuff. So, so today is really about maximizing what we can do in our design process, Tom, right? And what what we can do in public school to get it. So we at least set our sit set our kids up for success the best that we can. And in case people are not aware, um, Tom has a long career in designing shows um, as a band director and as a consultant. And Jeff has also designed many shows over his decades of teaching as well. So we have a wealth of knowledge here. And I'm really excited to get into that, how we did it in Biddeford, how we did it in Norwalk, how it translated into success and all that. I, I think one thing that uh, is critical we point out, uh, Kyle, and that is the fate of your group is determined before you teach a note of music, whether it's jazz ensemble, concert band, marching band, the, the planning process in getting the right material and, uh, and the right quality of material is the really critical element. If you don't have that, there's only so far that you can go. But if you do have it, uh, you know, the, the moon is a possibility. I think, Tom, you pointed out something important. So did you, Kyle. And that is um, the planning and the planning from the standpoint of meeting with the staff on a regular basis. And I know, Kyle, you have Westbrook meet on a regular basis uh, to prepare the show. And, and Tom, you said the guys from Colts met every week except for two weeks to plan. And that is, like you said, the, uh, the crux of it. It, you, your work is done before you take the first step on the field. And if you don't take the time to do that and pay it due diligence during the, that period of time, you, it backfires on you. And then you wonder what happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what does that process, what does that planning process look like? Well, uh, one of the things you asked us to consider is um, what the thought process was uh, behind uh, a couple of the groups that we've been with. And 
I think a, a case study in, in programming and the importance of it uh, was um, in uh, Biddeford. Uh, when I took over, the show was already established. So we for that one year, we dealt with that. But in our second year, um, we ended up getting an influx of middle school kids. We were bumped up a division. That created some problems in that the, the group was very, very young, and we were half the size of uh, several other groups in our division. So we looked at it and said, we've got to out-design other people, and we have to create an identity that's, uh, that's our own and convince audiences and con convince judges that we were uh, forced to be reckoned with. So we started like very, very early on with the, with the uh meeting uh, every single week starting in uh, January until we felt that the show was uh, hammered out. And it was a very interesting process with that uh, first show that we did uh, as a design team. Uh, and uh, we decided to do pictures and exhibition. And so from the beginning, it really got into what one of my things is in uh, marching groups. It needs to be worthwhile literature. And so, you know, Mussorgsky is most certainly worthwhile literature. Mm -hmm. We were evolving from a group that had played movie music and pop tunes, but we just felt a big change in identity was, was um, a good idea. So as we approached the show, we said, well, how can we be creative and how can we be smart about this? Uh, one of the things that we adopted early on was something that I got from George Zengali, and he had what they called freedom sessions. And that would be you'd have a meeting and any idea is was was not off the table from mm -hmm. the beginning it's like if it's not practical it doesn't matter just like be thinking and tossing ideas out there <clears throat> so you know we tossed around things like well what if the the show started in the dark well that wasn't really practical with stadium lights well what if we started the band in the the, the stands in the audience that wasn't really practical but we looked at the pictures and exhibition and said now wait a minute why don't we like get an art gallery out in the field of a reproductions of very famous artworks, giving us the opportunity for multicultural education. And also why don't we just start the show with the promenade, a walk through the art gallery. And that was strategic because the kids really couldn't march very well. All these middle school kids we had had never marched before. We were rough visually. So that's one show, part of the show that, it's not going to be evaluated from a visual performance viewpoint. And then a little bit later, uh, one of the ideas that came up in the Freedom Session was, what if we made the whole band disappear? Now, that sounds pretty silly. However, um, one of the movements of the uh, pictures is uh, Old Castle. We had a good uh, alto soloist, so we just staged it in such a way that the entire band did disappear behind the paintings. Uh, and... Uh, and we had this solo uh, handle the um, the uh, production. I'll never forget the first time that that, uh, that we did it, and uh, all the backgrounds are being played backstage with a drummer conducting the, the band, and it was an absolute disaster. And the staff was like, "Oh, this is crazy. It will never work." Well, it, it ended up working, and we had another production that we didn't have to be evaluated from a visual viewpoint. Then the the proceeding. Um, uh, production was uh, the uh, marketplace. And so we said, well, what can we do different in this situation? And we thought, well, the, the, the uh, silks, rather than having silks, they could be have like baskets, like a marketplace kind of thing. And so then we said, well, what do we do with the weapons? And we came up with this idea. This is pretty crazy. But um, we had like these large loaves of bread, which we, which we shellacked. Uh, so that they wouldn't, uh, you know, be flopping around, and they spun those instead of instead of rifles and sabers, and it, it really was a situation where uh, the audience loved it and the judges loved it because it was is creativity. So we were always aiming to be the most creative uh, band in the the circuit, and we also had a very high premium on connecting with the audience and. Uh, as a result, I, that was like a very important foundational spot because in subsequent years, we were able to build off of that. One last thing on the bit of a thing, the year afterwards, um, their uniforms are uh, orange and black and the uh, finals are near Halloween. So we figured, well, we could sort of tie this in. 
And I was really into an Andy Boyson piece called Conversations at the Night of the Night at the time. And uh, so we said, well, we could do that and build a show around it. And so that really got us into all of that kind of uh, macabre uh, music. And um, so, you know, the Bach to Cotter and Fugue and, and things of that sort. Uh, ironically enough, we ended up not using Andy's piece, but uh, we ended with a, a night on Bald Mountain. And so there were several very funny things that happened in that uh, season. We started the show, and when they, they have the announcement, you know, was the band ready kind of thing. Well, we had our drum major was like uh, kind of in a Dracula uh, kind of outfit, and uh, he was actually in a coffin. And so he creaks open the coffin, and that's, you know, the band is now ready kind of thing. And uh, in the first show, the, the judge, music judge uh, walking by um, says, holy, and there was another word that I can't say in this broadcast. And so then later on in the season, because uh, we had this, this for Night on Ball Mountain, we had this mountain. And then we had smoke with the mountain, and then we had lights. So, so I guess a volcanic mountain or something mm -hmm. or other. And so we get to the finals, and two funny things happen. One of the judges says to us at one point in time, Bitterfit, Bitterfit, your mountain's on fire. And then um, the end of the show was uh, like fading off into, into the uh, end zone, very like soft sounds and stuff like that. Well, the band parent who was doing the mountain thing, the uh, uh, smoke thing, because it's, it's the final, so we got to like really amp this up. So he amps it up so much, we get to like that spot in the show, and and I, I will sing you the ending of what it sounded like: clank, 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 and because uh, like everyone's mashing into each other because of, of of all the smoke. The point is that if you really make an effort to be really really creative, rather than we have three tunes that we need to stage on the show and whatever, that's not the exciting part about it, either for the performers or the audience or, or the staff. Think about it as, as a creative thing, a blank slate that you've got these, these ideas that I've always wanted to do that out in the field and, um, and run with it and use your, your contemporaries uh, on the staff to assist in uh, that very, very um, creative process. It's, it's terrifically rewarding and it, it really, really does work um, for um the kids for that process to work uh and this is something we can get into just a, a, a little bit uh, later uh but there has there needs to be a hierarchy there needs to be a structure and a strategy behind it jeff you're on <laughs> well no it was quite similar we uh we met in january staff of about 15 folks and we'd sit and listen to music everybody would bring a con contribution and uh we we picked the music we liked. We we tried to pick a piece, one piece that was the focal point of the show mm -hmm. to uh, that was a, a contraband piece because one of the stipulations I met, made was that the music had to be contraband first, had to be relatively new, and it had to be playable with the contraband. For for that, I'll give three examples. One uh, one show we did was based on Alfred Reed's Lotus Sutra. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I expected was that. I was the arranger, and uh, for our spring concert, the top wind ensemble would play Lotus Sutra, so the kids would understand it as a concert piece and not think, oh, this is marching band. No, this is a concert piece, and we have to bring the sound of the wind ensemble to the field. So we, we, we did Lotus Sutra. Another year, we did a Silver Accolade by David Gillingham, and a same process there. And then we did uh, Pulse Singers when Kings Go Off the War. And uh, mm -hmm. we did that as a contraband piece, and then we made it into into a show with other pieces, of course, in it. And so what we'd pick our, our repertoire, then we'd storyboard. Mm -hmm. What did we want to convey? What? How did we want to engage the the audience? And we too used George Zingali since he had been a teacher of three of my guard instructors. Mm -hmm. And uh, George Zingali had the twenty second rule, which there had to be something changing every twenty seconds to keep the audience involved. Yep. And we, we, we stuck to that plan and um, it worked well for us. The guard staff would come up with ideas. They'd come over with colorations. They'd come up with designs and uh, they'd come up with where they wanted things staged. And uh, we, we'd slowly put the show together at our, our monthly meetings. And um, then we'd go to the parents and say, well, we need these props. 
So for Lotus Sutra, we had 40 walls that were eight feet tall, four feet wide. <laughs> On one side was a picture of a uh, different type of lotus flower, all different types of lotus flower. Mm -hmm. On the other side was a picture of um, something in Asian culture. And so we designed them, but then we had to make them. So we had two parents who were aircraft designers and they made aircraft frames that would stand the wind on the field and made material that air would pass through so they wouldn't bulge. And then my colleague who was the orchestra director was also a uh, professional artist and had a degree in painting. So he painted all 40 walls for us. <laughs> and every wall was on a rotate rolling base. And uh, every guard person was responsible for bringing out their base. Because at, at that time, we had 210 in the van. So we had a lot of equipment to move around. And um, and then, um, you know, like when we did the, my last year, uh, when King's Squad War, when we did that, um, we built a castle on the field that was uh, 10 feet tall and uh, <laughs> 30 feet wide and had three stories in it. And it started with a bunch of trumpet players standing on the top playing with herald trumpets. Sound mm -hmm. familiar, Kyle? Mm -hmm. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh so we did we did stuff like that and then we do costuming and then uh, for my entire career as Noah my wife would make all the flags and she'd make about for every show about seven to eight sets of 40 flags wow. so she'd sew all summer and make flags for us and so uh, we had all our flags custom made and we uh, the band parents were so pleased with her they bought her an industrial machine so that everything was sewn real well and she researched the flags and flag material and everything and did that. So it worked out that uh, we had a big organization to do it and it worked out well. So then I uh, come up here and Kyle hires me to work for Westbrook. Well, Westbrook isn't a 220 piece band. It's a little bit smaller. And, but the concept works the same. Mm -hmm. it, you, just, yes. you take it apart, you storyboard it, you work it, you get staff's input. And I think the biggest thing that has to occur is that it's a collaboration of the staff and what they want and how they want it um you know sometimes it has, to, you know, it has to start early like for us it's november right right you know you it's, can't wait until april or may to start this process nope. right because like for me when i was at norwalk i would spend the month of the end of april and the, the uh month of may in the first two weeks in june writing the show horn wise and then i'd send it out to my guys in the percussion section to write the percussion parts and they had to have everything back to me by the first week in July so I could put it into a uh, pieware. And then I wrote the drill so that the uh, drill was written and um, making sure I got the staging as I, as I do with Westbrook every so many days or every, every week, I'd send out X amount of drill and they, they'd look at it and say, yeah, I like that. No, I don't like how you stage this. I don't like how you stage that. Can you restage this? Can you restage that? And, and, the, and we had a great conversation because I'd send it out and it wouldn't be more than two hours later that I'd be getting phone calls because we didn't have text messaging then. I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I got phone calls and I, I talked to human beings and we talked <laughs> it through and, and we, we, we adjusted it and I'd send back the adjustments and we'd go from there. And it was a back, give and take. And then we'd get the band camp and um, I was very fortunate. I had a huge staff so that when we would get to the end of uh, the first week of band camp, we would go all go out to dinner and we'd sit and we'd talk about the pros and the cons and what they thought would make it better. And some things we agreed to, some things we didn't, and we adjusted. And then uh, I came up with the thing that since, since we rehearsed so often, every Friday night, the staff and I would go out for pizza after rehearsal. And uh, we would sit and we'd evaluate where we are, what we need to do, and what needs to be fixed. And we'd always take 10 sets and we'd save them for the last two weeks of the season. And we'd have a total rewrite done. So the kids become, they get into that mode of competing every weekend, day after day, weekend after weekend. And they're, they're very set and firm on what they have to do. And you say, oh, by the way, these 10 sets are being thrown away and we have to learn this. And my first time we did it, some of my younger staff members said, they're never going to remember. They're going to forget. And I said, these are kids. Because you changed it, they're going to focus so hard on those last 10 sets mm -hmm. that it's going to promote, improve the whole show. But the ending is going to be outrageous because their mind is so focused on that. And it, they couldn't get into the doldrums where sometimes when you compete so long, you start getting down to that, oh, I can do it and I don't have to work at it anymore. And 
that that's a great it's a great out. way of manipulating the the teenage mind right well and that's the thing because i i how many bands have we all seen or have we all taught where you get into the mid-season and you're just trying to find ways to stimulate them to go forward to move forward and be more proactive it's like with westbrook we save a lot of body stuff till the second half of the season because mm -hmm. if you put it all in the beginning there, there's okay we're going to do that again uh do one more time now there's got to be some reason for one more time there's got to be something there for them to look forward to something to do and to keep them motivated to push and in norwalk our season went from the uh, our first competition was the last weekend in august and our last competition was the second weekend in november and we competed Every weekend, sometimes weekend, we we compete two and three times, and then we do uh, five to six football games. So we we were out there a lot, and then every every other Christmas vacation, we went to one of the bowl games of America shows down in Florida or Tennessee or Kentucky or Arizona or California or uh, Louisiana or Texas. You know, one of the things uh, you mentioned earlier, Jeff, is uh, the collaboration process and. It's interesting because staffs are set up in uh, different ways. The old, uh, older school aspect of it was uh, the top down where the band director walked in. This is this is what the program is, uh, and uh, either wrote it himself or um, had somebody else write it and then passed it on, kind of thing. Not a lot of communication, and certainly not storyboarding. That's one way of doing it. Um, I think the collaborative aspect is is, is very uh, so much more rewarding and so much more uh, important in, uh, and effective in the overall scheme of things. You mentioned about how you controlled an aspect of the uh, literature with the concept painting, and uh, I'm glad I was here today because uh, that was something I didn't know about your program. But it, you know, controlling the curriculum is an issue, particularly if you're going to go in a collaborative uh, effort. Um, because, I mean, the, the, the curriculum is derived from the quality of the literature. And as a teacher, that's primarily the thing that you're responsible for in the final analysis. Uh, in designing shows, it was always, uh, what would my college band director say about uh, this particular program? Uh, is it quality music kind of thing? And um, so we did it a little bit differently in, um, in uh, Biddeford. Uh, in that I would collect ideas before our first meeting and um, then try to incorporate them. And I would present uh, four, uh, three or four different scenarios, this program, this program, and this program. And each of them would have, um, say, three openers, four ballads, whatever. And collectively, the group could really, you know, discuss this. And it's like, ah, you know, the percussion person is like, no, this really doesn't work for me because or the visual person, whatever. So we came to a, a really a collective um, a decision on things. And I stayed out of it uh, because the way that I looked at it is all of these things that are being, that I'm proposing, I know a quality literature, I believe in them. And it's kind of deciding which of your kids is, is the favorite. And they would always say to me, well, what do you think of this? What do you think? And it's like, no, this is like, you guys are, are the people uh, my opinion is uh, not really critical at this point in time. And so really what it did is allowed uh, us to um, always uh, present quality literature, but the, the, the staff had a game in. It's not me going in and say, we're doing this, this, and this. Uh, that's one way of controlling the quality, but there's another way of just making people, uh, allowing people to have a voice in the uh, scheme of things. And it's funny, all of the years that we did this, we designed that way for six years. There was only one piece that I truly, truly wanted to do and uh, that the staff wanted to go in another direction. And again, I said nothing, uh, but you know, the, the trade-off is it was a Russian show. I really wanted to do uh, Boris Gudnov and they wanted to do um, uh, Russian um, uh, Christmas music. And uh, so that was not a bad trade-off <laughs> in any way. It's like, okay, you know, but that was something that worked very uh, well for us. I, I would stress the quality of literature as the thing that's most important. You, you made sure that that happened through your process and, and we did in Oz, even though it was a slightly different take on it. Mm -hmm. 
So as we're talking about design processes here, we're really, um, I want to talk about general effect music, mm -hmm. um, as, especially. Um, Tom, you have a, uh, a phrase where your definition of general effect music um, is a synthesis of visual and music in a way that engages and entertains the audience and the judges and, and everybody. Um, so in a second, I'd like to just talk about you know, what are we looking for? Like, let's start with some of the most common design flaws that we see. Um, these are definitely um, things we've all done. And I just want to kind of talk about some of the mistakes we make first. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, in all the judging that uh, I've ended up uh, doing in uh, all the teaching and design stuff, I, I think there are some uh, common flaws that show up fairly frequently. And uh, in no particular order, um, uh, pacing, uh, staging, uh, selection of proper uh, material, and uh, uh, sometimes a lack of a, a focus or clarity of, of intent. Uh, I would say that, that pacing is, is the biggest um, one of those. If we paid attention to Zingali's law more closely, I think a lot of pacing issues would, uh, would be solved. But again, it comes back to the, the planning process. If you're storyboarding this stuff and you're having those conversations uh, like that Jeff had with, with his staff and I tried to have with our staff, that's a question you ask as, as you design a certain thing and you're looking with, at the storyboard or listening to the sound files. It's like, okay, what right now is happening? We have 30 seconds and we haven't had anything of any variety. What can we do? without uh, compromising the integrity of, of the musical phrase to maybe create a little bit of a visual interest at this point in time. So something we can pick up on in, with the music to give us an, an event. Uh, sometimes it's, it's some, something as simple as a musical phrase ends and then there's a ping in the, uh, in the triangle. So there's a little bit of a punctuation, that sort of thing. And uh, some of that can be dealt with uh, in season but you really, really have to be creative with it. For example, sometimes if the in clarity of the intent is not there or the p pacing is a little bit of an issue, you can use a voiceover to clarify that intent, which is good. Um, I think it's a, something that uh, people have a tendency, honestly, to overuse the, um, uh, overuse the voiceover. If you have to have voiceover your entire show to explain every aspect of it, um, that's probably not optimum. And I worked with a drum corps, it was a good drum corps, and they had precisely that. It was voiceovers all over the place. And it was just to the extent that it was a little bit annoying to the audience. Mm. And uh, it really, the, the, the design uh, concept was so subtle that you needed to do something, but that wasn't really as effective as, as you'd like. So those are the kind of things that, that sometimes um, can occur. Yeah, one thing that hits me a lot is the clarity. Like, how do you make it obvious to the audience of what's happening? And I have a story from last year, our show, we were in an art museum. And we wanted to make it clear that we were in an art museum at the very beginning. So one of our staff members, was it you, Jeff, who told me well, how we, we wanted to do this? And I didn't believe it or, or something. But basically what we had is we had one of the guard members dress up as a janitor. And she's sweeping the field, actually a couple of them. And then all of a sudden, she has got a mic on, right, a body pack. And she throws it down and she says something the effect of what's what's going on why did people leave their trash in an art museum or something funny like that and it didn't really fit the show in a comedic way but clearly she was the janitor at the art museum and she told everybody that it was an art museum and that was a really easy way of everybody understanding what was going on and that was a really creative solution mm -hmm. so sometimes you know we have to i think in general we have to make it more obvious rather than less obvious while still making it artistic and creative yeah and to start that way was was outside the box for sure one wouldn't think it's certainly not a literal interpretation but it does uh demonstrate a bit of creativity and that's one of the thing as uh general effect judges that that we're always always on the lookout what a creative process has been there what little twists on something that uh, might be a common uh idea um one of my uh, mentors is a guy by the name of Jim Prime who wrote very uh, prominently for the cadets and, and star. And he wrote a little bit for, for Boston when I was caption head there. And uh, 
and he would always, you know, talk in those particular terms. It's like, uh, you know, he might be uh, arranging, uh, say, Prokofiev, and the mellophone part is like a little bit different, or the, the baritone part. And he said, well, I'm just looking to do a little twist. And Jimmer was someone who was very, very uh, literal in his transcriptions, very faithful to the originals, but he always s said an idea that needs to be something to make it just a tiny, tiny bit different. So that artistic viewpoint is something that's very important in uh, for us as judges in evaluating designs. And one thing we did is we brought that janitor back out at the end of the show and closed down the museum at night as well. Yep. So it so it tied it all together, and it was kind of funny too. Yeah, absolutely, and and then that is a, the, so there's there's a beginning, there's the whole middle, there's the end. It ties together there, and again, in that situation, you demonstrate a thought process. It's not just putting these tunes on the field. Yeah. I think that one of the things that, two of the things that I find that stick out on my mind is that I'll watch or I'll be judging a show and the um, flutes or clarinets are having a feature in the back stage right corner. And the judge is saying, well, I, I don't get it. And they get upset. Well, they're playing the feature. And I keep saying to them, why would you stage an instrument that has weaker projection in the back right corner when you could have staged them here. And a lot of times I think it is that when some groups send out their drills after they storyboard it to the writers, they aren't explicit enough saying this, this is a woodwind feature. And yes. I think they need to be very explicit about that saying, that I want the woodwinds featured here. I want the percussion featured here. I don't want the percussion sliding stage left to stage right in the back then they come down the 50 to the front to do a feature then they slide back and they slide stage right to stage left they're part of the show and i think in the design process um the drill writers the design visual designers need to look at it as there isn't a percussion section there isn't a brass section there isn't a woodland section there isn't a guard section there isn't a weapon section there is a band yep. and it has to be designed as a band how it all integrates and flows through and once again it comes back to Zal and Zengali about integration of all elements to create a formal setting and then I think the, the, the only other thing that um, worries me or concerns me also is when I'm when I'm judging is that people taking too long to develop an idea and you lose the attention of the listener in the process and i think dca when they changed their when we changed our format for judging where audience response was an important part of the show uh evaluation that helped us as ge judges because we had to sit back there and say well yeah the locals are all going to be happy about what they hear whether it's good or bad because it's their kids and their friends <laughs> mm -hmm. but how is the how is the audience truly responding to what the ensemble is doing and i think that we saw this year in DCI as well. How did the audience respond? And uh, I think that band directors would be advised to think about that because if you think about how your audience responds, not your friends, not the family of the kids, but how your audience responds in the overall design process, it will give you a better read on what you're doing and how you can develop it. But like you, you've said a million times already, Tom, it's done in the planning process during the course of the year. And those are the things you have to think about. And I think that's where a program like Pyware becomes very helpful because if the writer puts it into Pyware, then you can watch a movie of it and you sit back and say, well, that's not what I expected. And so you as a staff can sit back and say, well, what can we do to make that so it is what you expected? And if that process happens before your actually teaching kids then you can get it what you want because these you said these seasons are pretty short right and if you yeah. have se severe design flaw flaws it's hard to change too much you can we can we can tweak things right but if people are in the wrong place all the time it makes it pretty tough and and for me i'm lucky my best critic i live with my wife so i'll design <laughs> like 20 sets and then i'll say well, dear, what do you think? She said, you want the truth? And I say, yeah, I want the truth. He said, <laughs> I think that's kind of boring. 
And at first, you know, it's the always, oh, you thought what I wrote was boring. <laughs> and then you go back and you say, well, then why did she, if she's saying it's boring, somebody who is not vested into it might say it's boring. What can I do to make it not boring? So she gives me ideas and we share the ideas. And then I work at it for a couple hours. And then I say, okay, what do you think of this? She said, that's better. But why is that, why is that doing that? And I think that's an important process of the design thing too, is to have somebody who isn't afraid to say, no, I don't like that. Or no, that doesn't work because it, it's hard in the judging community. When I, when I've had groups, I've always said to the judges, don't be nice to me. Tell me the truth so that we can make this better for the kids and explain to the kids why you feel how you feel. And, and, that's how we grow. So quite a few of our colleagues want to be told, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Or how many times, Tom, have you gone into a critique and a person said, the kids practiced their tails off this week and we didn't get any credit. <laughs> well, there's a big difference between practicing hard and practicing correctly. Yes, and if you're practicing material that's not appropriate for their development level, then you're into a whole different thing. And I particularly in my jazz judging that is a lot of um what we end up uh, dealing with in there you know it's like well maybe you can consider some revoicings here but technically you're not going to get uh your trumpets for example to to be uh able to handle the stan kenton chat as voiced at this point in time and it's the same the same thing on the field the getting an appropriate situation and encouraging groups to really say the development level of the kid kids is such that you're going to have to uh probably make some edits in the the piece to give it a, a bit gl better clarity and that's not really uh a bad thing you know the clarity is the thing in the, the final analysis because you you can't be effective unless you're uh, communicating uh in a technically proficient way so how does we're talking about staging? How how does staging, Tom, affect musical effect? Well, it, it, the the classic case that um, that uh, Jeff mentioned a second ago, and uh, when I see this, I I really like want to scream, but immediately I'm saying is this is a fault in the design process when you have, for example, the uh, uh, br brass uh, up front and and the woodwinds are not audible just because of, of the physics of it. I can recall uh, judging a band at one point in time that had some really, really strong low brass players, and they were staged in the very, very front of the, uh, of, of the group. And uh, the staging really, they would have to play mezzo forte in a fortissimo passage in order to have a decent musical balance and for the melodic line or the important counterpoint from the woodwinds to be audible. And so a, a design thing at that point in time, and I can recall that one particular band, we kind of went back and forth on it. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, I really want to help you guys, but it is unless, you know, you get radical in terms of what the uh, balance is right here. You, yes, you do subvert the intent of the music uh, arranger. However, the overall music effect is uh, enhanced if the balance is proper. You need to be able to hear the tune. It, the other thing that is a challenge, it's not a bad thing, but the recent uh, idea of having the percussion staged in front of the the, uh, the wind ensemble, which occurs a lot, and that's something that comes to marching band from from uh, drum corps or maybe vice versa, but that can create some real, real issues in terms of musical communication. I mean, it's, if the, 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 the drums are really strong and they're right up front, mm -hmm. the winds are not quite as strong, and you really can't communicate other than communicating the, the percussion book. And so that's a thing where it's a, it's a bit of a give and take. If a staff is willing to do that, they can fix the, the problem. Uh, I can recall judging one band uh, last year that had precisely that dilemma. And all year we had this discussion. It's like, you know, listen, I, I, all the, the expression that the winds are doing is being covered up by the percussion. And so we talked about that week after week. Finally, uh, by finals, they made the adjustment but it was a combination of a staging thing plus like a philosophy. Our drums are strong, so we're really going to just like lay it out there. Well, as Jeff suggests, 
Um, it's the musical hole that's the most important, the GE hole. It's also hard when the percussion is in front to get the band to play tight, right? Because typically, especially if the percussion's in the back, you ride the sound from the back to the front, yep. right? And so when they're on the front, what the, what the horns behind them are hearing is a delayed response, yeah. right? So that's, a, that's another aspect of it that makes it hard when they're there. Well, yes, and in a way that is commonly rehearsed, and is, it's actually uh, very correct, is that the drum major is actually not the person who's, who's deciding this. They're with the center snare. Mm -hmm. So the, that's the symbiosis, and then it, it, it is dem demonstrated from there. The other thing that happens... More specifically, the, well, it, what, what, what the trick I use is the feet of the center snare. Yes. Right, not necessarily what they're seeing, but what by the hands, what they're seeing with the feet. That, that is absolutely correct, yep. and that's a way that works. Another very common thing, even to this day, uh, is that... Um, that the uh, front ensemble is watching the drum major. And it's like, no, they can't. They've got to listen back to fit it uh, uh, together in that way. But that's a really, really common one that still occurs at this point in time. That's a, a little bit disconcerting when I hear it on occasion, uh, but. They would only look up if say they had a feature, uh, yeah, right? Yes, yes. Or if, uh, you know, they wanted to somehow um, communicate at, at a high level, actually beyond the drum major. And that, that's one thing I, I wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, we had mentioned uh, in a previous conversation talking about the, uh, probably before the broadcast, but uh, Jeff was, you know, mentioning the lack of headwear these these days is a very, actually a very positive thing. And what's happened is that the um, the emphasis of the performers, it's, it's very much more of a visual thing. I'm telling you, it, uh, hits are choreographed to the great, to a great degree to emphasize the emotion of what's going on, but also the uh, uh, band members or core members proper. They all have a role. Facial expressions are, are a big deal. And, and I can tell you with the Colts, one of the biggest um, uh, things that we did the last week in the season was every single staff was on every single section about the whole idea of getting that communication to be up to the audience. And I'm excited for the fall because I think that with uh, a number of groups, that this is something we can really enhance their communication level by making them aware of. Because you know, in most situations, the kids are just like marching around doing their, doing their visuals and, and playing their music. They're not really thinking of that communication. It's not just what you put through your horn. Mm -hmm. It is the, the entire body. And what I found is that the kids really dig this. They really get into the whole... Um, acting aspect of it it doesn't have to be over the top but it's got to be communicative kids and this has been a recent development um uh, really really love uh the visual aspect of things i mean the the, the dance and the movement kind of thing that's part of the reason that a lot of the kids join drum corps these days when it started it was like when they f we first started to do like a little bit of movement or dancing as they call it it's like the kids are like oh you know kind of thing now if you didn't do it they would they would not uh, you know like be very happy and 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 it was so much fun with the colts to watch the last part of the season where they became visually proficient enough that the, the forms had a lot more clarity but also they truly truly got into every aspect of the the movement thing which was very very varied so i think it's a great possibility for us uh, come this fall to see what we can get out of that mm -hmm. so um is there anything else that you look for when you're viewing a band's program in the general effect caption? I'll toss that one to Jeff. Okay. When I'm, when I'm looking at a band from an effect standpoint, I'm focusing on how there is visual musicality. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, groups can be musical. They can be, spot on playing but if that musicality is not in the visual process as well i don't buy it because visual musicality to me is probably the crux of general effect and and you know you talked about all the things of body the facial yeah but i don't think some of our high school band directors understand visual musicality and i think it's a concept that that you, it's been around for ages but it's now becoming a demand it demanded that it occur within the confines of a show. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to 
what is your show about? You know, and, uh, you know, if you pick three pieces and that's it, well, it's kind of hard to link everything together. You can sort of mush it together, but you really can't um, sometimes. I, and that's where the design process has to think about the visual musicality of what you're doing. It, it, it's like if you're, if you're teaching a spiral and maybe your guard's creating the spiral in the process. And yes, the, the guard's going to get closer together, but if you listen to the music and the rapidity of the music, you're going to see the spiral going around and around and around. And what it resolves to is that visual moment, that visual musicality moment where you're building to it. The other thing that I think that we need to think about in, in effect is form. You know, as band directors, we went through college and we learned binary form, rondo form, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think a marching band show needs to have form. And I think as you look at it as a judge, you should see that form musically and visually so they correspond. I know when, when I was judging it, the effect caption, I would always talk to the people about Good idea, nice idea. Now, you said it before, Don, pacing. How are you going to connect those ideas so they flow together seamlessly and there isn't or aren't these abrupt stops within your show where, okay, well, you did this great. You did this great. But how did you get from A to B? And that's what makes it an effect. It's not the A and the B, but it's the transition to, the, to and from the A and the B section of music and the visual portion of the design. And um, th that's the thing that I think we need to look to. And if we think back to our music theory courses and think about all the form things we learned, I think that would help us greatly in the overall early design of a show, thinking about the form and uh, how it's all put together. That's absolutely uh, correct. I, I agree, Jeff. There needs to be a certain logic and a certain in inevitability, however you arrive at is, is really not so much the point is that there is that, that point of arrival. You're expecting something to happen as a result of the development that's, that's occurred before and bam, then it, then it does. Then the whole thing hangs together in uh, the right way, as opposed to being sort of a run on sentence. Yeah. I, I think sometimes, and we can look back to this past drum course season where you have phenomenal course just purely phenomenal course yep. and your and the book that they're playing is outstanding but sometimes there were little blips where things didn't just connect 100 mm percent. -hmm. and as you're sitting there you're saying "Ooh," it went by only for like a second or a half a tenth of a second but it was an ooh moment why did that not connect exactly right and um, I, I think in the band world, we need to be conscious of that. Um, how many times have we judged groups, Tom, where, you know, they play their hearts out. They have a pure wind ensemble sound out in the field. Time is, is just beyond, un it's unbelievable. But visually, their visual doesn't connect in as well as another group that plays a little less. And that's where we run into a little bit of a problem. And there, there as a GE judge, we have to sit there and say, okay, is the group that plays beyond reproach the best out there, the one that's going to get my effect score, or is the one that played a little bit less but had all the I's dotted and the T's crossed, but, you know, some kids are a little bit weaker performing. It, it, it's like I'll go back to what you said about judging jazz. Um, how many times have we gone to Berkeley? when Berkeley existed for high school groups and we'd hear these groups play these wonderful pieces and then lead trumpet you know what the lead trumpet note was going to be and it's like ah, 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 didn't come out <laughs> or, yep. or the uh, trombone section had trombone feature but only one person could play the feature or somebody's blowing the solo but they're blowing the wrong changes over the solo but yeah we, well we, we played this uh you know channel one suite not many bands can play channel one suite, but they, you, you know, you got to have the lead trumpet player. You got to have the tenor player. You got to have the, the, the saxophone player that plays the other solos. You got to have the trombone player and you got to have the rhythm section that can keep the feel going the whole time. Mm -hmm. and so you as a director have to pick the music that's appropriate to the skill level of the children you're dealing with. 
Well, likewise in marching band, just because we want to do uh, To Tame the Perilous Skies doesn't mean we necessarily can do To Tame the Perilous Skies because that word perilous can be a problem for us <laughs> as writing and teaching the show. So th th that's just my take on it. That's something I can't, uh, I can't top, Jeff. <laughs> when we're, you know, when for bands that are smaller bands and we're talking mm -hmm. about general effect, you know, that's a huge issue because I don't know, in my view, the easiest way to get general effect is put a thousand kids who play well in the field and play loud. And it's like, wow, you know, you hear some groups do that. And it's, it's like a, a, the easiest way to get general effect, but those groups who are smaller then also say, well, we can't get the same audience reaction because we're not as big. Right. So all the stuff we're talking about is any size. It doesn't matter what size you are. This, this works for all the sizes, but are there other things maybe specifically for small bands that they should be thinking about in their design process yeah. to make sure their general effect is top? I could take that one. I actually really enjoy uh, judging smaller bands because it really um, shows the creativity of the, the design team and the quality of, of the, the teaching. It, that, it's harder because, you know, if you have one and a part, it's really, you know, a wind ensemble uh, marching around. The transparency becomes really critical, but the opportunities for really, really very um, effective uh, um, presentation are, are there. It's just a question of taking the resources you have and using them the right way. Last uh, year in uh, the Nesba finals, I judged this uh, small band uh, a case from the southern part of Massachusetts, and it was beautifully put together. Very, very interesting show. And their attitude about it was volume as an effect is not something that, that, that we can do. That's not in our toolbox. But transparency can be in our toolbox, and it could be a distinct advantage over larger bands uh, that have all these many more plays that you're trying to get tightened down. If you have like three trumpets, you can get them to articulate exactly together mm -hmm. and have with a very transparent sound, but you have to approach it from that viewpoint, not trying to play the game that the, the larger bands uh, play because it's physically impossible to do that. And we've seen groups who've attempted to do that. And all of a sudden you have an effect that doesn't make it. It's like, listen, you have 15 kids out there you're not going to be able to create the sound of, of 50 or 60 kids. Um, so it is, it's a, certainly a uh, design uh, possibility or design opportunity, I, I say, rather than, uh, oh, man, we don't have many kids. So, you know. It, it, but you know that in the design process, you know you don't have a lot of kids. So make sure you don't use that tool. And unfortunately, there are some uh, times people don't do that. And then it's a little bit late in the game. I mean, you can point that out to them and you know maybe the next year that they will make those adjustments but in, as it's happening it's like that's just a little bit of a drag to deal with yeah i, I think you're 100 right and i think one of the maladies that i've seen over the years is that small bands with music writers and drill writers trying to write a show that would be conducive to a large group mm -hmm. i think as writers we have an obligation to take a look at our clientele and write for the cl size clientele we have. And like Case does all the time, they've done it for years, they do it admirably with a lesser number, but yep. staging it just right. And, um, you know, yeah. And we're finding also as we're going along in the past few years where due to COVID, uh, sundry other things, sometimes we can't have um, a drum line on the field. We can only have a front ensemble. Yep. So teaching to that concept, but you know, I, I always, whenever somebody says to me, well, you know, my front ensemble is my drum line. They're up front all the time. It's almost impossible to do. I said, I said, go back to 2004 and go to the BOA finals and look at Tarpon Springs, yeah. <laughs> how Tarpon Springs had a front ensemble. They had no drums on the field for years yep. and their effect was supernatural to what they what they pulled off and it was always meticulously done and um I, I i just think that the writers the people that are fellow band directors where they may be the writers or they may hire somebody to be writers need to realize when you're writing for 48 kids or you're writing for 148 kids it's totally different and you must make the 
adjustments for that size ensemble. Absolutely. Um, so what is the relationship between visual general effect and musical general effect? You know, how, how are they related as from a, a judging standpoint? Because I know, you know, we talk about general effect being the combination of visual and music. So is it just that they're working together or is there a specific, specific way that they relate to each other? I, I think there's a lot of similarities b between them. Uh, and this is one of the things within the judging community. Like, are we looking at the same thing, but just to, from a visual lens versus a musical lens? It's like really the same thing? In essence, yes. And one of the things that, that uh, DCI has done, I, I not necessarily totally successfully, is the, what they've done is every GE judge is a GE judge. So they'll hire on a panel someone with a, with a uh, visual background and then a, a, a music background and expect both of them to deal with music and visual at the same point in time. Some people do that a lot better than others. And, uh, but uh, it's, you know, one of the trends in, in, in the activity locally, we still have this uh, uh, difference between the two. But I, I think that what you're looking for, first and foremost, whether it be visual or, or uh, music, uh, general effect is communication with the audience by whatever means. And so in the visual aspect, how uh, visual tools are used to create that effect tends to be a little bit more of the emphasis. And then in GE, uh, the other the other uh, aspect of, you know, in, in reverse, one of the things that uh, Mass Judges Association is, is uh, dealing with at this point in time is precisely that whole thing of how we get things integrated and really uh, giving um, proper emphasis to all aspects. So say from a GE viewpoint, you don't want a sound file that has total emphasis on the winds and very little or no discussion of percussion and, and, uh, and guard. And uh, that's one of the things that is an association we're dealing with because some of that stuff is, is still out there. And uh, we want to have the, the greatest holistic approach that we uh, possibly can. So we had a lot of stuff that we wanted to get to today in this podcast, <laughs> and it turned out to be one of those show notes that's like, like three different show notes. And <laughs> my, my brain is kind of going everywhere. You know, I feel like we've mentioned a lot and I hope that we've been able to offer some, some practical advice ideas to Jeff, your phone's ringing some practical advice ideas to band directors who are, who are listening. <laughs> um, so we do have just a couple minutes left. Um, so Tom, I know there's probably a lot we have not gotten to that you'd like to get to, but this is your chance to to get to that. So what is it that we haven't haven't talked about that you'd like to get out there? Well, actually, what I would like to sort of uh, summarize with or, or just deal for a quick second, we've talked often on in this uh, recording about whole creative aspects and how uh, important it is to get the right material in your kids' hands and to have a, a creative uh, bent. That is, is really critical in the overall scheme of things as far as I'm concerned. It's a key to having uh, programs grow to, to, for teachers to really like take a chance. Sometimes it's not going to, it's not going to work all that well. Uh, as a judge, when I see that not happening, you know, there's a creative attempt, but it doesn't quite coalesce. I'm, I'm very quick to say, I don't want to um, at all stunt your desire to think outside the box kind of thing, because that's where the fun of it uh, comes and the opportunity for audiences to say, I want to see that show again kind of thing. That really ought to be what the uh, design focus is. And that creative opportunity is really to me, something that's uh, invigorating. It's what kept me going as a, as a teacher in, in the activity. It's like I can exercise my creativity here, create something that's never, ever uh, occurred before. And you have to have that mindset, not like, well, it's all been done before, so therefore. Well, maybe it's all been done before, but it hasn't been all done before with a twist. And that creativity aspect of things, the biggest thing that I could – recommend and urge all those listening to uh, be concentrating on. 
but you even mentioned this. This is one of my pet peeves. People say it's been done before, but like, yes, but my job is to teach these children. Like that's been done before, but not by them. And they've never seen it before. So even though we're trying to push the envelope, there's no reason you can't do something other people haven't explored because your kids have no idea what it is. Uh, yes, on 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 uh, two ways. Firstly, they haven't uh, experienced it before, and second of all, in the marching arts, we have this like odd thing that it's got to be like this avant-garde, brand new, that never been done before. But I don't think that the Boston Symphony says, you know, we played Beethoven's Fifth. So he's be done. We're before. not doing that. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, 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 and that was it, 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 Jeff. That's one of the crazy things about the activity. When I hear people talk along those lines. It's like, now wait a minute. I mean, if it is done well in the right way, and you know, uh, it, sometimes people veer from quality literature because, well, we I just we just have to do something, you know, that's that's new and contemporary for the sake of being contemporary. And it's like, well, not all music is necessarily contemporary music is necessarily great and not all music that has been around for a bit is off the table i think that's a little uh silly but we tend to be silly in this activity on occasion jeff you got to get in the car in a little bit and take a long drive to band camp what what Sorry. what what have we not covered that you'd like to have the people understand about I think we've covered just about everything that you and I talked about. But what I would suggest is that why don't we invite Tom back at the end of marching band season? And so we can all reflect on what we've seen and heard during the course of the year and talk about how it's how it went this year, because this is actually hopefully our first post COVID season. Mm -hmm. I would be glad to do that, Jeff, if, so, I, if I get invited. So, yeah. So November, it's on like first half of November. Sounds good. Yeah, I think that, you know, a recap is sometimes very beneficial for all parties concerned. And hopefully our band director friends will come back and listen because what you've learned during the season and what would come up now and with the recap can possibly lead you in a different direction or in a easier direction. Because some of the things we may suggest in the next podcast is here are some easier ways to do what was done to make your life more productive and give you more time to spend on your concert program and your jazz program. I'll be taking notes uh, uh, all fall, Jeff. Uh, trust me. But uh, I was I was just telling Tom if he opens his computer and goes to the podcast app and finds a show, he can press the plus button and it can automatically show up. So when Fred Ford comes on with us that Tom will see that automatically. He doesn't have to wait for my email. There you anything, go. anything beyond the on button is beyond me, kids. Um, <laughs> if anybody wants to, you know, I've been very happy to meet with both you guys today. Um, and if anybody would like to reach out to you for advice or whatever, um, I would just ask them, just um, go on growingband.com and reach out to the show. And if you want to talk to them, I would send you, send them your way if that's okay. That would be absolutely fabulous. And you know, one thing I want to say, thank you uh, so much, uh, Kyle, for inviting me this morning. And uh, it's uh, Jeff, it's always great to have conversations of this uh, sort with you. I've had a lot of fun this morning. Good. Me too. All right. Be well, everybody.